2 Corinthians chapter 1 I, Paul, have been sent on a special mission by the Messiah, Jesus, planned by God himself. I write this to God's congregation in Corinth and to believers all over Achaia province. May all the gifts and benefits that come from God our Father and the Master, Jesus Christ, be yours. Timothy, someone you know and trust, joins me in this greeting. The Rescue All praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times, so we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. We get a full measure of that, too. When we suffer for Jesus, it works out for your healing and salvation. If we are treated well, given a helping hand and encouraging word, that also works to your benefit, spurring you on, face forward, unflinching. Your hard times are also our hard times. When we see that you're just as willing to endure the hard times as to enjoy the good times, we know that you're going to make it, no doubt about it. We don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. And he did it, rescued us from certain doom. And he'll do it again, rescuing us as many times as we need rescuing. You and your prayers are part of the rescue operation. I don't want you in the dark about that either. I can see your faces even now, lifted in praise for God's deliverance of us, a rescue in which your prayers played such a crucial part. Now that the worst is over, we're pleased we can report that we've come out of this with conscience and faith intact, and can face the world, and even more importantly, face you with our heads held high. But it wasn't by any fancy footwork on our part. It was God who kept us focused on Him, uncompromised. Don't try to read between the lines or look for hidden meanings in this letter. We're writing plain, unembellished truth, hoping that you'll now see the whole picture as well as you've seen some of the details. We want you to be as proud of us as we are of you when we stand together before our Master Jesus. Confident of your welcome, I had originally planned two great visits with you, coming by on my way to Macedonia province and then again on my return trip. Then we could have had a bon voyage party as you sent me off to Judea. That was the plan. Are you now going to accuse me of being flip with my promises because it didn't work out? Do you think I talk out of both sides of my mouth? A glib yes one moment, a glib no the next? Well, you're wrong. I try to be as true to my word as God is to his. Our word to you wasn't a careless yes canceled by an indifferent no. How could it be? When Silas and Timothy and I proclaimed the Son of God among you, did you pick up on any yes and no, on again, off again waffling? Wasn't it a clean, strong yes? Whatever God has promised gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. In Him, this is what we preach and pray, the great Amen, God's yes and our yes together, gloriously evident. God affirms us, making us a sure thing in Christ, putting His yes within us. By His Spirit, He has stamped us with His eternal pledge, a sure beginning of what He is destined to complete. Now, are you ready for the real reason I didn't visit you in Corinth? As God is my witness, the only reason I didn't come was to spare you pain. I was being considerate of you, not indifferent, not manipulative. We're not in charge of how you live out the faith, looking over your shoulders, suspiciously critical. We're partners, working alongside you, joyfully expectant. I know that you stand by your own faith, not by ours. Chapter 2 that's why I decided not to make another visit that could only be painful to both of us. If by merely showing up, I would put you in an embarrassingly painful position, how would you then be free to cheer and refresh me? That was my reason for writing a letter instead of coming, so I wouldn't have to spend a miserable time disappointing the very friends I had looked forward to cheering me up. I was convinced at the time I wrote it that what was best for me was also best for you. As it turned out, 
There was pain enough just in writing that letter, more tears than ink on the parchment. But I didn't write it to cause pain. I wrote it so you would know how much I care. Oh, more than care, love you. Now, regarding the one who started all this, the person in question who caused all this pain, I want you to know that I am not the one injured in this as much as, with a few exceptions, all of you. So I don't want to come down too hard. What the majority of you agreed to as punishment is punishment enough. Now is the time to forgive this man and help him back on his feet. If all you do is pour on the guilt, you could very well drown him in it. My counsel now is to pour on the love. The focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. So if you forgive him, I forgive him. Don't think I'm carrying around a list of personal grudges. The fact is that I'm joining in with your forgiveness, as Christ is with us, guiding us. After all, we don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We're not oblivious to his sly ways. An Open Door When I arrived in Troas to proclaim the message of the Messiah, I found the place wide open. God had opened the door. All I had to do was walk through it. But when I didn't find Titus waiting for me with news of your condition, I couldn't relax. Worried about you, I left and came on to Macedonia province looking for Titus and a reassuring word on you. And I got it, thank God. In the Messiah, in Christ, God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. Through us, he brings knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, people breathe in the exquisite fragrance. Because of Christ, we give off a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognized by those on the way of salvation, an aroma redolent with life. But those on the way to destruction treat us more like the stench from a rotting corpse. This is a terrific responsibility. Is anyone competent to take it on? No, but at least we don't take God's word, water it down, and then take it to the streets to sell it cheap. We stand in Christ's presence when we speak. God looks us in the face. We get what we say straight from God and say it as honestly as we can. Chapter 3 Does it sound like we're patting ourselves on the back, insisting on our credentials, asserting our authority? Well, we're not. Neither do we need letters of endorsement, either to you or from you. You yourselves are all the endorsement we need. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit. Not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. And we publish it. We couldn't be more sure of ourselves in this, that you, written by Christ himself for God, are our letter of recommendation. We wouldn't think of writing this kind of letter about ourselves. Only God can write such a letter. His letter authorizes us to help carry out this new plan of action. The plan wasn't written out with ink on paper, with pages and pages of legal footnotes, killing your spirit. It's written with spirit, on spirit, his life on our lives. Lifting the Veil The government of death, its constitution chiseled on stone tablets, had a dazzling inaugural. Moses' face as he delivered the tablets was so bright that day, even though it would fade soon enough, that the people of Israel could no more look right at him than stare into the sun. How much more dazzling, then, the government of living spirit? If the government of condemnation was impressive, how about this government of affirmation? Bright as that old government was, it would look downright dull alongside this new one. If that makeshift arrangement impressed us, how much more this brightly shining government installed for eternity? With that kind of hope to excite us, nothing holds us back. Unlike Moses, we have nothing to hide. Everything is out in the open with us. He wore a veil so the children of Israel wouldn't notice that the glory was fading away. And they didn't notice. They didn't notice it then, and they don't notice it now. Don't notice that there's nothing left behind that veil. Even today, when the proclamations of that old, bankrupt government are read out, they can't see through it. Only Christ can get rid of the veil so they can see for themselves that there's nothing there. Whenever, though, they turn to face God as Moses did, God removes the veil and there they are, face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old, constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete, 
We're free of it. All of us. Nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of His face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. Trial and Torture Chapter 4 Since God has so generously let us in on what He's doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. And we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. If our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think he can give them what they want and that they won't have to bother believing a truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. We're not keeping this quiet, not on your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe, and what we believe is that the one who raised up the Master Jesus will just as certainly raise us up with you, alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever.